Okay, good luck, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have our crowd? Is everybody here? All right, well, thank you all for coming. This is the swift shift to E. Um, I'm Trevor Wiley. I'm a collection workflow consultant for ProQuest. I handle the Southeastern United States as well as uh, military and government libraries nationwide. My other panelists can introduce themselves. I'm Stacy Marion. I am the acquisitions librarian at American University, and I'm also currently the co interim director of tech technical services. My name is Carol Barker. I'm from De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to cover really how uh, acquisitions was affected by COVID-19, particularly with regard to print and e. Um, I'm going to share my experience as a, uh, a consultant, and then I'll pass it to Stacy and Carol to give a more um, zoomed in uh, specific review for what they did at their institutions. So, um, so as we all know, there was widespread disruption caused by COVID-19 starting in the spring, um, and this resulted in a rapid shift to E, um, but that's really where similarities end on how it affected things. Um, you had your students, they couldn't access your print collections. Maybe you weren't set up to provide everything in E. Um, so that just resulted in rapid change like nothing we've really seen before. Um, I'm very proud to say that the attitude top down at ProQuest from the very beginning was help, don't sell. Um, we recognized what you guys were facing and the, the message was really just get in there and see what we can do. It wasn't viewed as an opportunity in any way. Um, and I'm sure that attitude was mirrored by other vendors, so not just a ProQuest plug. Uh, so through most of March and April, I'm just getting on the phone with my customers, um, seeing where they're at, seeing what specifically was bothering them, uh, what things were going on at their institution. Um, and the result of that was a lot of uh, questions around action versus inaction. Um, as you know, these complex acquisition strategies across multiple platforms, multiple vendors, they can take years to get in place and then working as you expect. Um, so there's a lot of hesitancy to tear that up overnight. And really the more complex your program was, uh, the, more, the more unlikely you were to want to immediately change something. Um, now I do have a little underlying theme in my presentation today of you know, outliers and exceptions. I think Stacy and I, we were changing their whole plan almost top to bottom on March 15th, 16th, somewhere right at the top of COVID. Um, so there's always change. And as time progressed over the last nine months, most of my customers wound up moving away from what they were doing. Um, but I'll get into more detail of that shortly. Uh, the two big emergent strategies for print customers were uh, moving toward e-approvals. So buying eBooks instead of print because it's absolutely that simple every time, right? Um, we're converting part of their acquisition strategy to DDA, um, which you're probably all familiar, but if you're not, it's demand-driven acquisition. It is identifying a pool of content and then only purchasing that content when your patrons use it to state it about as simply as you can. So uh, we'll move into March and April. This is really what I call the season of uncertainty. Um, on the print side, we saw widespread print suspensions. Um, mostly academic libraries asking ProQuest to hold books for them while they figured out what they were doing. Um, a lot of you were down to skeleton crews. Some of you, you were sent home wholesale for a period. Some of you are still working at home entirely. Um, but those who did have staff in and could receive books, precious few that they were, uh, there was a lot of concerns at that time around virus communicability. Um, if someone in the ProQuest warehouse contracted the virus and didn't know, would that be passable through the books, through the packaging? Um, so there was a lot of concern, do we need to quarantine? Is there a way we can realistically um, you know, cleanse the books or whatnot? You gotta remember back in March and April, we didn't know near as much about the virus as we did now, or as we do now. We didn't know if uh, how long it would last. Um, you know, some people were telling us it'll vanish in the summer. You know, be over in no time. We didn't know if it would affect the fall semester at all. You know, now from where we're our current vantage, it's like, well, will it be over by 2022? Do we know? <laughs> um, unfortunately, so. And then on the print side of that, there's a lot of concern around future availability of titles. 
uh, particularly for certain academic monograph series, which often have a short run, uh, at least at the time. I'm sure publishers have adjusted that a little bit now, uh, made E more widespread or available um, more widely. Um, but on the print side, this really boiled down to do we halt shipments as, I mean, ProQuest was happy to hold things in the warehouse until uh, our customers could receive content. Um, but do we just halt shipments or do we move away from print entirely? Um, so at the beginning, everybody was halting shipments and over the past nine months, virtually everyone's had to move away from print in some capacity, be it wholesale or partly. Um, but of course, E is not a magic bullet. Um, and so there are exceptions and outliers, but the PDE availability was a major problem at the time. Uh, typically in the academic market, the print book comes out first and it may have an E format available at that time, or that could be days later, could be 18 months later, it could never get an ebook. Um, I know I had one customer look at moving their approval plans over to E entirely, and only about 40% of what they were collecting was available in E at that time on any platform from any vendor. Um, so that was a major consideration that kind of wasn't seen ahead of time. Uh, I've already mentioned short run monographs, some of those particularly the more obscure ones that have a smaller audience. Many of those only come out in print um, or don't have a, or if they do have an ebook, it's uh, not available immediately. Um, and then beyond that, you know, many of you, some of you have, you know, half a million titles or more available at your physical location. But a challenge on the east side is um, if you're, you send all your students home in the spring semester and then everyone is using your electronic resources. And particularly at that time, it's hard to, to ramp up, be it through subscription pa packages or purchasing unlimited access content. Uh, just having that strain on your e-resources um, entirely at that time, and it was a real challenge. So. Uh, moving into the remainder of the fiscal year, if there was a quiet period during COVID, it's this. Um, by this point, most of our major customers have, you know, picked a new strategy for the pandemic. It's up and running. They're feeling the new pain points. Sometimes they're finding new things they like about what they've changed. Um, but there's also the concern with the fiscal year looming and their inability to move funding between uh, fiscal years, whether or not they could continue to hold their shipments. Um, so in many cases, I had customers ask us to release the shipments we were holding, bill them for it, and then resume the hold on their, their physical content. Um, and then in other cases, I had customers who actually had their fiscal year 20 budget reduced. And so we had to split shipments down to the dollar sometime to make sure it was what they could transact on at that time. Um, but over on the east side, those that moved to E in the early period, they had their own challenges. Um, again, I'll invoke exceptions and outliers, but the average one user uh, ebook in the academic market is maybe 10, 15% more than a print book. So not a big deal if you're just buying a one-off copy or a few for a class, but if you're buying 1,000, 2,000, 7,000 books a semester, like some institutions are, uh, that little bit extra really can, can derail your, your planned budget. Um, similarly, on the DDA side, if you move to DDA, either away from firm orders or from approvals, uh, the cadence of DDA expenditure is difficult, where you tend to see spikes at midterms and finals and whatnot. Um, so if you've got a new DDA plan, it's your first venture into DDA, and you have it ready just in time for finals, in a spring semester of 2020, that expenditure might shock you at first, um, being so much more. And then, you know, having to recognize that is going to come down, but just getting used to that can be difficult. So around this period, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of concern about which fiscal year we're going to build something on. Uh, you know, for example, you might have a subscription that you use that your patrons love. Um, that's up for renewal in August. Well, there's around this time, we're also seeing a great deal of anxiety around the fiscal year 21 budget. So there's concern about whether that could be, could be shipped early um, or provided in a simpler way that would work out better for, uh, for different institutions. So uh, moving on into the new fiscal year uh, 21, um, much of the fear kind of came home to roost at this point uh, as far as what the budgets would look like. I did have a few people come through unscathed, but by and large, 
Um, we're seeing a lot of five, 10% cuts, specifically in acquisitions uh, to firm orders, et cetera. Uh, the worst case scenario in my heart really goes out to, to this particular institution, but they saw an 80% reduction in their budget, uh, which effectively torpedoes your acquisition strategy. Um, I, I can only imagine the, the conversations behind closed doors there. Um, and uh, I see the widespread rise of what I'm calling we might take this back fiscal year 21 budgets, which are, you know, almost as bad as having a huge cut, I would think. Um, in that case, the administration would put a hook in the back of whatever the fiscal year 21 budget and say we might take this back or need most of it in December or January, so don't spend it. So now you're in a weird situation where you have a either a solid budget or you know, better than expected, but you don't know if you can actually spend it. So that was far more widespread than you would expect. Um, at this point, uh, I kind of looked for where there are correlations in state uh, budgets. You know, if you get two similar institutions in the same state, would they have a similar fiscal year 21 uh, budget result? Um, and that was not the case. Uh, similar across, over on the private side, it was really a throw of the dice. Some, uh, my private school, uh, clients were the worst hit and others, you know, found the way to make it happen and really had no consequences in fiscal year 21. Um, there was a persistent trend that those who tightened their belts early and were a bit more cautious in the spring were able to keep that reduced uh, collection strategy in place. I don't know. Obviously, I wouldn't be privy to it. I don't know if they were able to move funds between fiscal years or if they were just regarded as good stewards of their budgets throughout COVID or whatnot. But uh, it really held true that if you tightened up early, you could probably continue with that. Um, but by and large, the new fiscal year really brought about minimalist collection styles, in many cases, um, shutting plans off and then just reviewing them monthly or quarterly and seeing what would have matched and buying only what you need, which is unfortunate. So, and it, of course, accelerated the move uh, toward, toward e-content. So, uh, once upon a time, I thought we might have an hour or more to talk about all this. So I started cutting and slicing data and looking at a million different ways. Um, then I found out we only have 30 minutes. So all that work, this is the end result, um, more or less. And I just wanted to show broadly what my customers did based on their strategy at the outset of COVID. So with the dark columns, what you're seeing are like my print heavy customers who primarily 80% or more of their content comes in print. Um, and then on the other side, my e-customers, who are predominantly or is predominantly E are in the, the lighter gray colors. Um, but from left to right, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, if you went through a major collection strategy overhaul, 90% of my print heavy customers did. That's kind of to be expected. Um, whereas on the other side, my E customers, maybe 20%, that's probably turning off a DDA or starting a DDA realistically. Um, strategize shipments, not really a big surprise there. It's the print heavy customers that have to strategize their shipments. Um, the middle cluster, I think, is really what's most interesting. Did you keep your budget going for fiscal year 20 or did you cut immediately? Um, so about 80% of my print customers stayed the course there is what that's saying. Um, so it just, it made me wonder if there's something about just, just if you're more invested in print, does it make you slower to react? And whatnot, but still, I mean, half my ebook customers uh, stayed the course there as well. So, um, finally, uh, maintained or increased your fiscal year 21 budget. What we're really seeing from this is about 70% of academic libraries had a significant cut in fiscal year 21. Uh, there was a presentation from a survey yesterday. I was happy to see that their numbers tracked pretty much with what I was seeing. Um, so it's good to know we're, we're seeing that across the board as, as sad as a 70% of uh, institutions seeing a budget cut. And finally, maybe it's a bit of a throwaway, but I was just curious who made no changes or made no changes as far as their setup. Maybe they just dialed back firm orders. Maybe that's how they handled it. Um, but so around 20, 25% of my customers made no real change. So, but I'll pass it over to Stacy now and she can tell you in detail what they did at American. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. And let me get up my slides. So I'm going to talk about what we did at AU. Um, and as you see, one of my titles is co-interim director of tech services. So 
that mean that meant that I made the decisions without consulting with anybody. <laughs> it was, it, you know, I just decided that I was going to decide what to do. So our pre-COVID approval setup, uh, we have a collection management team of 10 subject librarians that cover 44 fund codes. So luckily we already had an e-preferred program set up. So we had 10 subject areas that are listed here that we already were getting an e-preferred. And we also had an existing DDA program uh, for everything that didn't meet the approval profile. So luckily we did not have to actually set up anything new. So the week of March 13th, uh, when all of this was happening, I was actually in Texas at ERNL at the conference. I didn't bring my laptop with me. So during that week, I'm on the phone with my co-director trying to manage shutting down our unit that week and trying to get everybody uh, home, figure out how everyone was gonna work from home and to close the unit. I realized immediately that we, while I guess we would probably be considered one of Trevor's print heavy books, even though we did get e-books e in a lot of um, subject areas, I realized, oh my gosh, we're gonna have a big problem. So we have to do something with the approval print books. So I emailed Trevor on March 13th. I'm like, we need help. Uh, either move everything into ePreferred or move everything into DDA. And that we were prepared to deal with the print that was already in the pipeline. So after consulting with him, uh, we decided that the, well, Trevor made the recommendation that the easiest thing to do would to be, was to move all of the subject areas into the e-preferred, not the DDA, that it was less complicated and quicker to do that. Uh, we would still be receiving print titles if no ebook was available. Trevor um, talked about the complexity of ebooks, not everything is available in e. And instead of consulting with our collection management team, I just told them what we were going to do. Um, oftentimes with our team, we are, we they can be very effective, but I was not prepared to you know, have them ask me, well, can you get me data, statistics, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nope, this is what we're doing. So this is the email that I sent to our collection management team on March 19th, where I told them what we were doing. I tried to um, outline the situation of, you know, mail services, the university, shutting, shutting things down. Um, we would put a uh, uh, procedures in place to monitor the spending. Uh, Trevor could give us title lists. Uh, if, if and when we were back you know, to normal, whatever, whenever that was going to be, we could have title lists so that they could order the print uh, if they wanted to, especially I was thinking mostly of my humanities librarian who he did not have anything he preferred um, pre-COVID. He liked to get everything in print. So the message, this was all based on the university telling us that we were only going to be closed until the beginning of April. So we were also prepared to keep ordering print uh, for reserves and interlibrary loan. So as an aside, uh, what the most complicated thing that I had to deal with at that time was mail services. Uh, our technical services unit is offsite. We are not located in the library. Uh, our building was closed and locked. It was available for swipe access, but closed and locked. ProQuest ships UPS. UPS can no longer get into our building. All UPS is supposed to be diverted to mail services. So they put a sign up on the door saying, hey, UPS, you know, here's another address that's a mile away that you have to deliver things for. Uh, we had boxes sent back to ProQuest. Uh, when I did this slide, we were six months in, now we're eight months in, and mostly the mail is pretty smooth. Um, things are working properly, but, you know, I never, ever would have thought that I would be pulling out my hair trying to get the mail sorted out. So this is just a timeline of the quickly changing events at AU uh, from when it was announced we were going to be working for home for how long for two weeks and then suddenly by the end of the month, you know, mid April, we're working from home indefinitely. Uh, and on April 27th, I told mail services to start delivering. They were holding our mail uh, and I said, deliver, 
uh, I live a mile from campus. And so I was prepared and I did starting in April that I was the only one of the whole unit that went into work every week just to deal with the mail. Um, so the current situation is we are still online only. Um, the main library is open for staff. Students can reserve, even though we're online only, we're in Washington, DC. We have a lot of students who are in the area. They're living in apartments. So we have made the library available um, for study space that they can reserve. Uh, we have curbside pickup. Print is not dead, contrary to popular belief. So we are back to ordering print for faculty requests for reserves and for interlibrary loan. I have not made any changes to the approval plan since we went e-preferred. Trevor did come speak to our team via Zoom in July about um, the DDA program that we have set up. And as a consequence, our science librarian has now moved all of her titles into the DDA program. Uh, we already had our education librarian move her titles into the DDA. I did have to allocate $200,000 more for approvals. Uh, and luckily, we, we managed to finish the fiscal year with no cuts. Whoops, there we go. Um, let me just put that slide back up. I have two couple more things to say. Um, for fiscal year 21, we are kind of in that situation where we were initially told your budget is safe. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it's not. So um, as of right now, we have not given money back. We've been told we have to give money back. I don't know when, where, why, how much. Um, so, but I, you know, I foresee that at least until the end of this fiscal year, the approval plan, we, we will just be e-preferred. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Carol. Let me stop uh, sharing my screen. Oops, hold on. I think I'm stuck. I think it's up at the top. I'm sorry, okay, Carol, there you go. <laughs> right. Okay. Right, is that looking okay? Can everybody see that? That looking cool? Fantastic, thank you. Um, so as I said, my name is Carol Barker, Senior Assistant Librarian of Bibliographic Services at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK. So the situation, I'm sure you've heard it an awful lot over the last few days. Um, in February 2020, changes were taking place in the library and on the campus. Um, as it got to March, lockdown was becoming highly likely. And like everybody, we had no idea how long the library would be closed, but it was probably going to be months, at least a couple of months, I thought could be longer. Uh, the key question for us was how could we provide a service from a closed library? The buildings were, was going to be closed and the campus would be closed. And specifically, which high issuing book issuing high issuing books did we only own in print? So very fortunately, our ProQuest rep, Sam Siddle in the UK here, got in touch with me very quickly um, and he suggested doing a DDA uh, for these titles. We've got some DDAs running already for our reading list titles. Um, so I generated a list of all the print in our collection, but only the titles with 25 or more loans since 2015. Um, so just looking at the high issuing print. Um, that generated a list of 37,000 titles, which I thought was probably too many for a DDA because I wanted to make this project affordable and sustainable. Um, we were at the end of our financial year and we hadn't got a lot of money left, but I wanted to be able to do something. So I only submitted the more recently published titles for business, health and sciences, sciences and uh, slightly older titles for arts, design and humanities, and then sent this uh, slightly reduced list to ProQuest. Uh, the list of high issuing print in our holdings was then matched uh, using ISBN, which I know uh, there can be problems with matching with ISBN, but it was really all we had in the, in the time that we had. Um, so it came back with probably quite a small list really of 800 high issuing titles. They were available in E and we didn't own them. So that was great. Um, the fact that it's small means we've mostly been buying the right stuff already, which again is a, is a positive thing. Um, 
further checking reveal, revealed that we did have some of those already in stock, um, so we didn't need to buy those. Uh, so these titles were added to a new DDA pool specifically for this project. Uh, we excluded titles costing more than £250. Again, we did that to try and make this project affordable and sustainable. Um, I set aside a budget of £10,000, which again isn't a, a great deal, um, but it, it, it seemed affordable. We felt like we needed to do something. And the way we do it is we put a deposit up front with ProQuest so that we don't have individual invoices to, to pay. It's just drawn down against that deposit. Um, and I set up alerts in ProQuest Live Central and that notified me on a weekly basis um, what the budget was, but also got a, a an alert set up so that there was a, a notification if the budget got down to 20% and then 10% uh, just to let me know how things were going. In fact, it was going okay. So we added another 300 titles. Um, those with 15 or more issues, they were added later. So since the 7th of May, when it, it really got going, we've had 166 titles purchased. We've gone slightly over budget, but I think actually it's been, it's been worth it for those students that have been able to access it. In all things considered, it's not been an expensive project. Uh, interestingly, the average cost per title is £82, which compares with a slightly more expensive firm orders. And the only reason I can think of that the, there is this kind of average price difference is perhaps because we were buying more um, backlist titles whereas firm orders might be for more front list titles. I'm not exactly sure. I'd need to, to look more at that. But as well as spending that, we've obviously saved quite a lot because 754 titles were not purchased. We're still running the project. They're still available to view. Um, and the value of those titles is £65,000. So it, they're still there, but we haven't had to uh, buy them. So that's been a saving for us. And as you know, from usage, a lot of eBooks are only viewed for, for seconds or minutes and so this won't trigger a purchase, so we've not bought those. I think it's important to look at the usage of the unpurchased titles. Um, 126 unique users have looked at 101 titles. They haven't been read. We, we haven't, uh, they have been read, but we haven't purchased them. So that's, that's a really good uh, benefit to us. I've done a very brief comparison of this high issuing print to e-project compared to our normal reading list DDA, which, which just runs throughout the year, um, and firm orders. So although in the same time period we bought more firm orders and it got more usage, I still think that for those uh, unique users of our, of our DDA, it's been a really worthwhile project. So I've kind of answered my own question, I guess. I think it was a success. I think for those uh, users who accessed the titles, both those that ended up being purchased and weren't purchased, um, I think for them it's, it's had value. And if you look at the equivalent cost of the usage and the titles that were used, it equates to about 26 pounds per user for access to those titles, which yes, is slightly more than an interlibrary loans request over here, which would be about 15 pounds. But the advantage is we now own some of those titles. So I think that uh, it's the access over ownership, but we do actually own some of those titles. So I think that again is, uh, is a valuable thing. So if I were to make some recommendations, uh, we're only five months into the project and the DDA ran during the summer vacation. We are continuing it though, because I think the next uh, eight months or so will be will be interesting. We need to provide access to these books. So we'll evaluate the project uh, next summer. When we've had uh, a bit more time has gone past. We'll have a look whether there's any trends in subject areas, usage, that kind of thing. See if we can learn anything from this. Um, I'd recommend you always keep a separate list, uh, a separate DDA list for a project like this so that you can see exactly what is in your title pool and set up a, a fund code just within ProQuest. Um, and then you can see what's been purchased against that fund code. So it helps you keep track of what's been uh, purchased and you can keep track of the usage a lot, uh, a lot better. So overall, then, yes, definitely. I'd do a project like this again. It's been it's been great. Thank you. And that's that. All right. Well, if anyone wants to type questions, we can answer them, or you can have a minute of your lives back and and go to something else. So, thank you all for attending. There's something in the chat. I have a question to Carol. 
Um, do you use short-term loan for your DDA, Carol, or do you only purchase outright? We only purchase outright. Um, I did consider the short-term loan, but I just didn't feel, because I think that there's various different pricing models. For us, I think we just decided, okay, we'd go down the DDA and then, yeah, it triggers a purchase rather than doing the short-term loan. So we've, we've not gone down that route. And then another one for you, Carol, how do you determine the per title cost limit? Uh, it's a guess, really. Um, I think I looked at the, the prices of all of the, the books and the vast majority were less than £250 anyway. There were just a few, as always, there's a few outliers. And you kind of think £800 for a title is probably, for this kind of project, seems quite a lot of money. So we thought, OK, £250 seems to be a, a sensible cutoff where we've got the vast majority of titles in, but the few outliers that are very expensive uh, won't, won't get included in the project. Yeah, typically, you can look at what you own and what you tend to firm order, and you can identify a good break point uh, mm -hmm. that would still potentially capture 80% of what you buy, but not automate it for DDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's kind of a, a soft science to it. So, yeah. All right. This one's for me. Do you think you'll ever pressure publishers to give you forthcoming ebook title information so it isn't always a guessing game of when you're receiving something? Um, I think we're pressuring publishers to do that 12 months out of the year, honestly. <laughs> so, um, uh, from Dawn, it's been very interesting to hear about all your adjustments as librarians during this time and how they mirror sudden changes to the vendor world. It helps to be creative. Thank you all. Just a comment there from Dawn. Uh, it was really a unique time. Um, it's never felt so collaborative working with customers to like mm. address where they're at. Um, I'm not saying I ever want to go through it again because it was tremendously stressful for, for both uh, the vendor and the customers, but um, it was a very interesting time. It was just unique challenges left and right. So, I have my comment is not uh, is just working with Trevor was you know I sent him an email on March thirteenth and and six days later we had changed the plan. So and I know I'm one of you know how many customers do you have Trevor that were e emailing you exactly the same thing at the same time. So, uh, um, Stacy, there's actually a question for you. Um, uh, have a backlog of print titles that need to be processed and paid for or do you need to work through um so we're we're that. working through the backlog that's a good question so from april until august i was going into the office um once a week i wasn't dealing with the print i was just staging them um we did actually at one point have proquest hold the print for us so at some point you know, during the summer, I said, okay, you can release it. We'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. so at the beginning of August, my staff started going back to work. Uh, we have some staff in technical services who are still only remote, like the ER people are only remote. But my acquisition staff, we, we are on a, a schedule, uh, sh different shifts. You know, we're working in pods. So we have people there every day. And I've also trained, I mean, um, I've trained some of the cataloging people to receive the print books. So a combination of everyone pitching in, we are slowly getting through the backlog. I, I predict by the end of the year, we will have processed, we, have, we will have moved through all of the backlogs. So, yeah. Uh, Joan, thank you for your very kind comment. I uh, appreciate that. Um, but also just to expound a little bit more, it may not have come across that American, they're doing e-preferred. So they're trying to get that ebook when possible. And I think your wait period is 21 days. So 20 yeah, we changed it, I think. Did yeah, you change it. Okay, it might be a bit shorter. But no, anyway. no, I think you're right. Yeah. Am I right? Okay. Yeah. Could be mixing people up. It happens. <laughs> um, but essentially after 21 days, if we don't have an ebook for a new publication, then we send American the print. And they right. take it away. So. Right. So we are still getting print. I mean, on average, we I had asked Trevor, you know, what did he think we would be getting? And we should be getting 50 to 60 books a week as opposed to 250 books a week, mm -hmm. you know, that we were getting. So we will still be getting print, um, just a lot less. Yeah, you fared a bit better than some, I think, in what was available on E in terms of what you collect. 
So I had some customers who, when they looked at moving to E, it was like 40% of what mm. Which almost isn't worth doing or so complicated. So, all right, that looks like it for questions. Um, so, I guess we'll hang out here for five minutes till the session closes or until everybody. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy, do you use uh, short term loans where you are? We have never used short term loans. So we, we've had a DDA program for over 10 years, like 12 years. Um, we've never done short-term learn. We've, we've always had kind of the philosophy of purchase to own. Mm -hmm. so we, we buy. Yeah. 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 Short-term loan has its advantages sometimes if you need it, but I typically don't recommend it because you want to use your budget to purchase content, not to rent. Right. Um, right. But sometimes short-term loan, it just, it fits if you're only using uh, DDA for particular subject areas where a loan makes sense or where content ages out of relevance very quickly, um, say sciences or medicine, for example, um, depends. I mean, every program is different. So. Mm. The other thing that we've done is an evidence-based program. So we did one a few yeah. years ago with Taylor and Francis, and we're now doing one with Elsevier for our science librarians. So mm -hmm. that you pay up front a certain amount of money and then you get access to you know five times that amount of books so say you give the vendor five thousand dollars and you'll have you know access to a hundred thousand dollar books whatever mm -hmm. you get access to more and then after whatever your time period is so a year a year from now then we will actually select the books that we'll own and then the books that we don't want will be pulled out of the catalog. So it'll be based on usage. You know, it's usually the top, however many books that equal the amount of money that we paid them up front. Mm. Um, so yeah. we're trying, we tried it with Taylor and Francis. It was, it was okay. Um, and now we're trying it again so mm -hmm. like for science oriented titles. So we'll see. I don't think ProQuest has evidence-based type programs. We do sometimes. You have to really want it and you have to talk yeah. to people. And I mean, if you're, if you're interested, we can certainly accommodate. So yeah, that usually starts, conversation starts with the sales rep rather than me. Typically. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Everything can be done. So. <laughs> I feel bad. I turned up the air before this presentation because it like keeps you more alert and whatnot. I thought I'd cool it down and now I'm like almost shaking. It's <laughs> my office so uh, that kind of backfired so. Uh, another question for carol how do you track dda expenditures in your ils when you prepay or are you not concerned with the individual book prices and the acquisitions model that is a tricky one um i think the only way really to do it is to look in lib central and then by having a fund code, I can pick out what the expenditure has been uh, and do it that way. Um, but that just means then, as I say, we're not sort of uh, having the budget run away with us. We kind of set aside, say, £50,000. We put that in. It maybe lasts, I don't know, I'm guessing kind of like six months or so. So we just know that that money is set aside, which is kind of great for us end of financial year putting that uh, deposit with ProQuest and then just draws against it so it's kind of yeah it just it just ticks away and does its own thing so it, it seems to work really well um, but then as I say adding a fund code within um, Lib Central means that we can then look back and see which was the the resourceless DDA and which was the um, high print uh, DDA so that they've got different different fund codes just to differentiate um, so, so yeah, that, that works well. And the, the reporting in, in Lib Central is really good. So you mm -hmm. can get an idea of the usage and everything. And I'll just yeah, offer a comment on that. Uh, sorry, Stacey. Um, in Lib Central, we can set up a budget tracker that will email mm -hmm. clean monthly reports and can actually shut off your DDA after a certain amount of expenditure. Oh, nice. That's off, good to know. But pause it. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, Stacey, you were going to say. Oh, no, I was just going to say we have a deposit account for our DDA as well. I just replied. Mm -hmm it every year I sort of allocate you know at the beginning of the year okay this is how much money I'm going to set aside for mm -hmm. and it's a it's a similar similar thing yeah 
Uh, Joan in the chat commented she's used STL and it has saved them money. Uh, Joan, if I remember, yeah. I think you have a very specified program in nursing and maybe one other subject, but yeah, it does have its its applications for sure. Mm -hmm. So oh, I think we're about to be automatically kicked out. So I'll end the session. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. At 200 240 some. Yeah. All right.